Okay, so before I begin, um, I want to thank the community that helps me out in my lab out, because all the, all the stuff that gets done is primarily done by all these faces of young 20-somethings who do the work. And of course, we all must thank them first. So this is the lab from postdocs to students and technicians, and then this is the lab uh, from some special undergraduates as well as high school students within that inner circle. And they really make everything go, just as the microbes make everything go. Okay, um, three questions I'm interested in. First, targets. And that, as I was explaining, is how does, oops, how does ecology shape parasite genome evolution? So when microbes enter the niche of a host, that host now has a community of interacting microbes, and we know very little about how much genetic exchange happens between microbes that co-infect the same host, as well as how often their genomes move from the microbial genome into the host genome or vice versa. So these are questions at the target end. That is, how does the host selection affect genome evolution, gene exchange of these entities? Secondly, agents of change. Does the microbiome cause speciation? So here we're just showing humans populated with a bacterial symbiont population, of course. And over evolutionary time, these two things have become different species. But al along with their genes, we also can suspect that the microbiome may be changing alongside speciation events. And the question that I'd like to talk to you about today is, is how important is the microbiome to speciation as we benchmark it against the nuclear genome? And is this a frontier that we need to confront as evolutionary biologists and ecologists? And the third topic, which I won't be able to talk about today, and these are the two specialties that we look at, are sort of an interconnection between the host genome and the microbes, which is what are the underexplored dimensions that shape animal parasite interactions? So beyond the immune system, uh, beyond nutrient acquisition, and beyond cell-cell uh, interactions, microbes may do other things besides hijacking those entities. We're interested in how microbes hijack the host epigenetic machinery to perhaps mediate their pathogenesis. We're also interested in the vertically transmitted microbiome and the quantitative genetics of host genes that structures the vertically transmitted microbiome. But I'm sorry, I'll have to leave that for another time. Okay, so let's start with agents. Uh, can the microbiome turn one species into two? And it's always good to go backwards to our, our leaders, our luminaries, and Darwin himself, when writing The Origin of Species, didn't exactly have all the points down on how does a new species arise. In fact, he left that question to future biologists. He was excellent at understanding how varieties form, how competition breeds new varieties, but he also wondered how is it that we get these varieties to form well-defined clusters of new species? What are the traits that drive that? What are the evolutionary pressures that drive that? At the time of the modern synthesis, Dobzhansky writes this very famous book that we all know, Genetics and the Origin of Species. And Dobzhansky lays down the genetic foundation for how we view speciation today, largely. That is, the genes are the stuff of reproductive isolation and speciation. Um, and he elegantly mapped out this concept both in the dobzhansky muller model of hybrid incompatibilities as well as on the, on the theory of what a species actually is. What's interesting to me is that we often forget even in the symbiosis field, is that 10 years earlier, Ivan Wallen, who actually proposed that mitochondria are derived from bacteria, so before Lynn Margulis ever proposed that, this was actually deep in our timeline of biology, and he saw that these mitochondria divide by binary fission, and he reasoned that if these are bacteria, then they must be fundamental to the unit of life, and therefore to the evolutionary change of life. Ivan publishes this book, which has a uniquely similar title to Dobzhansky's book, Genetics and the Origin of Species. Except if you just take out genetics and put symbionticism in, you've got the same title, right? Symbiosis has largely been underexplored in speciation. Genetics really rules the day. And uh, I'd like to try and convince you that we need to interconnect these two theories, go back to the roots, and think about what maybe we've missed so far in understanding how parasites, microbes, commensalists, interact with their host and, in fact, drive speciation. <clears throat> okay, so to do this, it requires kind of a, an upgrade in our framework about how we think about the unit of life or the unit of selection. And there's a growing tide, although there isn't a lot of proof yet, that, in fact, the unit of selection may not be 
the genome, but the genome plus the microbiome of an animal or a plant. And this we call the hologenome. So here's just a cartoon of a human body. It's obviously got different tissues with different microbial communities on those tissues. Each tissue may have a specialized microbial community, if you will. What's, imp what's important to know here is that while the genome has 20,000 unique genes, the nuclear genome of a human, the microbiome has a hundredfold more unique genes, two million genes. Does this functional compartment actually represent a second genome from the nuclear genome? Is it as important as the genome in shaping evolutionary processes such as adaptation, certainly, and speciation? Maybe. And this is the question that I think biology has to confront. We may be wrong. There may not be any important co-assembly or persistence of the genome and the microbiome together, but it's certainly a question we have to ask. What are the rules if there are any? Okay. So let's consider a standard speciation model here where we start with a, least, a last common ancestor of this hologenome, right? And over time, these two populations split due to some reproductive isolation barrier, and then speciation is complete once these two organisms are fully separated with reproductive isolation. At that point, the hybrids may die. They become sterile or inviable. Okay, good. I got a little bit of laughter there. <laughs> All right. Um, so is this, in fact, something that occurs in nature? Is the microbiome assisting the evolution of new species and causing reproductive isolation when we bring these species together? And I will say that most of the data out there today focuses a lot on diet from mammalian microbiomes. And if you eat a certain microbiome, if you eat a, a Western diet, high fat, high protein, you get a lot of microbes that are different than if you eat a vegan diet. And we know that the microbiome is, in fact, associated with obesity. So within an organism's lifespan, diet has a profound effect on the microbiome of the gut. Infectious disease also changes the microbiome within a lifespan. And so we tend to think of the microbiome as being part of the environment because it can be dynamic within a lifespan. But the other side of this is, is, in fact, is the microbiome in fact governed, at least in part, by the host genome? Is there a phylogenetic component to the microbiome? And you'll see headlines like this that emphasize the dietary uh, influence that your inner bugs are what you eat. What if we do something different? What if we take an evolutionary uh, sort of schematic and say, if we control for diet, what will the hologenome look like? And this is one theory that we've plotted out in a Trends in Ecology Evolution article uh, last year, where we hypothesize that the host genetic divergence as it increases will positively associate with the host microbiome divergence over time when you control for the diet, right? Diet clearly has an effect. Let's isolate that variable and ask, is there a phylogenetic component here? If there is, we should fundamentally see this association. And as a result of this association, we should see a pattern of co-divergence between the host phylogeny and the dendrogram of the host microbiome. Now, you often see these charts in the form of symbionts, like vertically transmitted endosymbionts, have a similar phylogeny to their hosts. This is fundamentally different. What we're looking at here is the sequence, the genome divergence of the host compared to the cluster community analysis of the host microbiome. In other words, this plot here, this community is more similar to community two than it is to three in terms of the total number of microbial species that live in that organism. So it may be that these two species share 80% of the, of the microbial, the host species share 80% of the microbial species, whereas these two host species share only 50%, and these two species share only 30% of their microbiome. That relationship at the community level of the microbes could be put into a dendrogram that parallels the host genome. And if that is true, that would be one test that the hologenome is stable over evolutionary time. And if we repeat this in other systems, it would be even more convincing. So essentially, we wanted to look for persistence in the co-assembly of these two things. Okay, the central hypothesis is that the microbiome is as important as the genome and speciation. We look at this from two perspectives, a narrow sense and a broad sense. So the narrow sense is that microbes cause speciation directly. 
you don't need any genetic divergence to cause speciation. It's just simply one population with one microbe and another population with a different microbe when brought together can't compete. Uh, sorry, can't interbreed. A good example of this is Wolbachia, which I'll talk about shortly. A second concept is the broad sense, which is that the microbes are, in fact, co-assembling with the host genome, that there is a persistent interaction between the immune system and the microbiome that forms this hologenome. So instead of just looking at particular symbionts, think about every animal and plant having a microbiome that interacts with, with its immune system. And the immune genes of an animal take Drosophila, humans, and chimps. The immune gene set is the most rapidly evolving set of genes in the genome. They're also under the most adaptive evolution. So if the immune genes are rapidly changing, that in turn should feed back into the microbes changing rapidly as well. We are attacking these questions with uh, the Nasonia model. This is a parasitic wasp. It parasitizes flies. Um, this is the male date uh, with a female. So the male is cleaning up. This is the female who's also cleaning up. And he's going to come and try and do a little dance and court her for uh, a mating. Uh, as you watch this video, I want to tell you that the phylogeny of this Nasonia is really useful. These are very closely related species. So Vitropenis is more divergent from Giralti and Longicornis, which only diverged 400,000 years ago. This ancestor occurred a million years ago. We're going to use all of these species in the talk today. Uh, this is their phylogeographic uh, distribution. And this is a perfect model system to study speciation. We have full genome sequences. We have genetics, thousands of molecular markers. RNAi is systemic. Um, we have interspecific resources for QTL mapping with large phenotypes. There's lots that you can do with Nasonia. I would argue that it's second to Drosophila as a genetic model system. All right. So during, um, during some of our earlier work on the microbiome and speciation, we were looking at the narrow sense concept of symbiont-induced speciation, which is if you take two of these species, Giralti and Vitropenis, and they're all Wolbachia-infected, and these Wolbachia infect the reproductive tissues. So this is actually the testes with the accessory glands. And in red is Wolbachia, and blue is the host nucleus. So these are Wolbachia-infected testes tissues. If we do interspecific crosses, the control crosses are normalized to 100% survival. The interspecific crosses are shown to be quite depleted in hybrid production between the two um, species. This is an older species hybridization that diverged about a million years ago. And this is a younger species hybridization that diverged 400,000 years ago. Both show very strong hybrid mortality in the F1 generation. When you cure the high, I'm sorry, when you cure the parents of their Wolbachia infections, hybrid production goes markedly up. In fact, it actually exceeds that of the um, control survival in some cases. This was probably the first and, and best case in which microbes were shown to directly cause reproductive isolation in a young speciation event, thereby um, at least supporting the concept that this can happen in nature. But it's still just Wolbachia. And I'll tell you about Wolbachia's distribution, but it primarily occurs in arthropods. So this cannot be a universal mechanism of speciation like Haldane's rule, for example. So we're turning now to the broad sense. And we've been looking at the gut microbiota of Nasonia. So this is obviously a cross section of Nasonia with the gut sort of dotted out in lines here. And most of the bacteria, which are gamma proteobacteria, uh, are shown in the hindgut here of Nasonia. Now, if you look at other insects in comparison to Nasonia's microbiota, most insects, in fact, have a predominance of gamma proteobacteria in their gut. It's as if the insects need gamma proteobacteria, which is different from mammals such as humans and mice. And the humans, you can see in purple here, they tend to have two different types of communities, Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes, which are probably uniquely qualified for their particular guts. So at a phylum level of bacteria, these phyla here, there's already sort of segregation of phyla according to host taxonomic character. Mammals, mice, and humans tend to have Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes. These insects tend to have gamma proteobacteria. It's a very small sample size, so obviously we can't take a lot of weight in it. If we look beyond the phylum level at the individual species of bacteria across development, we see something interesting. So here's the larva microbiome of Nasonia. Um, the OTUs, which stands for operational taxonomic units, or species if you will, are the types of microbes that are inhabiting these larvae. 
and the abundance as well. So we can see a very simple microbiome here with one predominant type of bacteria. In the pupil stage, we see an increase in diversity, a quite significant one, sometimes five-fold, six-fold higher from the larvae. And then in the adults, we see a further increase in microbial diversity. So as Nasonia age, there's a blossoming of microbial diversity over development. And this is not uncommon. This is also seen in humans from uh, early childhood through three, four years old, there's an increase in microbial diversity, suggesting that different microbes are functional at different time points in an organism's development. Um, and just for comparison's sake, I mentioned that Nasonia is a wasp. It parasitizes flies. Uh, this is a flesh fly. This is its microbial community, and not so surprisingly, it's very similar to the wasp larvae, which feed on the fly. So here we can see the uh, clearly an exchange of dietary microbes from one source to the other, right? Okay. So here is the phylogeny of Nasonia based on the genome. And then this is the dendrogram analysis of the microbial community, where we're looking for parallel changes in these trees. In the pupil stage and the adult stage, we see an increase in microbial diversity. And if we map the relationships of their microbial communities, in both pupae and adults, they recapitulate perfectly the evolutionary history of Nasonia's genome. So we see development-specific communities that then recapitulate the evolution of the ancestry of Nasonia. So the genome is related essentially to the microbiome in the same ways across these species. That's the fundamental tenet of what we're surely setting out to do here, which is once we normalize diet, do species complexes structure their microbiome in ways that recapitulate the evolution of that organism? With this being a phylogenetic signal, I think we're, we're, what we're seeing here perhaps is a phylosymbiotic signal of the microbiome. And whether phylosymbiosis is more common uh, is certainly something we want to pursue in the future. So now that we've seen phylosymbiosis in Nasonia, it begs the question, what happens when we make hybrids between them? As if there's a uniquely qualified microbial community for vitropenis, and there's a uniquely qualified community for Geralti, what is the hybrid microbiome looking like, and how does it affect reproductive isolation? So in a more general sense, and in the broad sense, you can imagine two species that have been selected in harmony to sort of balance the immune system and the microbiome. The immune system is buffering the microbiome from becoming pathogenic or overproliferating. However, if we make hybrids, there could be some negative epistatic interactions in those hybrids that cause problems. One would be pathogenesis, where uh, the microbial community turns over wildly and becomes pathogenic to the detriment of the host and perhaps kills it. Another one is that there is a dysbiosis where the hybrid genotype can no longer regulate its microbiome properly because it has immune genes from two, two species and it can't quite get them to work together to control the microbiome. And so we just have a loss of, let's say, good species with a hyper-expressed immune response. So we're talking about hybrid breakdown here, but we're talking about it from a hologenomic perspective of the genes in the immune system technically affecting the microbial community. Okay, so if we put this all together in theory, and I'm showing you the cartoon and not the theory, um, the theory is, is that if we look at the dobzhansky muller model of speciation, which predicts that essentially hybrid problems result from negative gene interactions between two populations. So take an ancestral population, two locus ancestral population, it diverges in one locus and one population, this becomes big A, this one has a mutation in locus B, it becomes big B, you bring them back together and big A, big B uh, negatively interact and the hybrids die or become sterile. Um, under a two locus model, we see three potential dobzhansky muller incompatibilities when you throw symbionts in as a third locus instead of, um, instead of the, the nuclear locus, so we have two loci plus a symbiont population, we get six potential incompatibilities. So just by incorporating a very simple microbiome uh, into this model, we actually see six to, six to twice as much incompatibilities here. Six times here, two times as much incompatibility. So the microbiome as a genome has the potential to accelerate the evolution of hybrid problems, if you will. If this is true, we should see it. And Nasonia keeps turning out to be a great model for this work. So here's um, Vitropenis and Geralti, 
in the pupal stage. And if we cracked open these fly hosts, we'd see these pupae fall out, along with some host junk. Not that much, actually. It's pretty degraded here. This is a hybrid. This is F1 hybrids. I'm sorry, F2 hybrids. And you can see a lot of the host skin is around here, and there's very few pupa. Um, if we plot the mortality that's occurring in this cross, we can see that normal parents produce on average 40 or so offspring per host. As the hybrids die, we see a marked reduction from the larval one stage to the larval four stage, which slightly continues to the adult stage. But about 80% of that mortality is happening in this larval development stage. If you look at the larvae that are dying, which are shown here, this is a melanized, somewhat shrunken larva. This is a healthy, pure species control larva. Melanization is not to be underestimated. It's usually an indication of an inflammation response due to infection. And so we were thinking that given the phylosymbiosis pattern that we saw, given the melanization that's happening in hybrids, if we put these th two things together, the prediction may be that the microbiome goes awry and becomes sort of unhindered, unhinged, if you will, and causes this death. So we set out to look at the larval microbiome in old species, young species, and hybrids. Um, this is the larvae, of course. These are the two uh, taxonomic units that tend to occur in the Sonia larvae, Proteus and Providencia, which are gamma proteobacteria, and then just other species. And so if you look at the parental larvae, they have a lot of providencia. If you look at the F2 hybrids, we see 90% mortality in this hybrid cross, and the larvae are carrying a different microbiome. The proteus bacteria has gone from minuscule to dominant microbe, and this may be associated with the mortality because they're happening in synchrony. Um, if we look at the control species pair, the younger species pair, um, they actually have different microbiomes. What's key here, though, is that the larval F2 hybrids where we don't see any mortality looks a lot like its parental microbiome, Nisonia longicornis. So when the microbiome looks like the same parent, we don't see mortality. When it's different from the parents, we do see mortality. Okay. So if you were to show this graphically in a sort of more intricate and arguably more complicated way, um, what we've got here is a 16S tree of all the bacterial OTUs in our study. Uh, this is the fly, the host, and then this is Longicornis, Duralti, and Vitropenis. And what's colored are the taxa of bacteria that are, on, are in those particular larval stages of development. And then the abundance is shown with the bar chart. And you can see here the hybrid microbiome compared to the parental microbiomes, and then this hybrid microbiome from Longicornis and Duralti compared to these. And we note some of the more different microbes that occur in the hybrids versus the non-hybrids. I'm not going to dissect this because it's a little too small to see, but if you put it on a dendrogram, uh, what's called a unifract tree, you can see that the larval microbiome parallels the evolutionary history of the host. So Vitropenis pure species is more divergent than Geraldine longicornis' microbiome, which are more closely related. Now the hybrid that dies is the VG, and that microbiome looks a lot like the longicornis microbiome, as well as the, Longi the Longicornis Duralti hybrid, which doesn't die, looks a lot like the Longicornis microbiome. So you might be scratching your head here and saying, well, how is this associated with mortality? And our rationale is that the VG microbiome is a microbiome that Duralti and Vitropenis never normally see in their parental populations, right? This Longicornis-like microbiome has risen in a vitropenis duralti background, and vitropenis and duralti are quite divergent from these two, from these genotypes and microbiome types. Whereas the longicornis duralti hybrid has a microbiome that looks a lot like one of its parents. So again, death is associated with a unique microbiome from its parental species. And this is our little cartoon showing that phylosymbiosis emerges out of this bacterial culture plate where a tree can be drawn through the phylosymbiotic signal as well as the phylogenetic signal. Okay, correlation is great. This is kind of where we are. Now we want to move on to functional tests. And if bacteria cause hybrid mortality, there are very simple predictions, right? So a non-hybrid Nisonia will live. A conventionally reared hybrid will die. We know that. We've shown that. A germ-free hybrid Nisonia, if bacteria cause mortality, will live. 
we take a hybrid that should die, we take out its bacteria, and that hybrid will live. And then we can reinstate mortality by inoculating hybrids that are germ-free with microbes to recause cause the mortality. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, uh, my grad student, Rob Brucker, developed an in vitro rearing technique to rear Nasonia germ-free. Um, we do it with a cocktail of fly, hemolymph, and antibiotics all smashed together. And then in these filter cups, the eggs get placed on top of the filter, which sits on a meniscus layer of this cocktail that's um, essentially what the larvae now feed on. And then the larvae become pupae, and some of them even go to adults. So we can rear them completely germ-free, and this is what we see. So in a conventional rearing, we see severe mortality of the hybrid genotypes, 80 to 90% mortality. In the germ-free rearing, we see almost complete rescue of hybrid survival, and we've simply just taken out the microbes, right? These are still the same hybrid genotypes. Um, and then if we put the microbes back in, and we've only taken a few species of microbes, not the whole community, if we put a few microbes back in, we see enhanced mortality as we would expect. Okay, so this is convincing um, that the microbiome is as essential to the genome in hybrid reproductive isolation in this particular taxa, right? You can't get speciation or hybrid uh, mortality without the microbiome going awry. What's fascinating is that uh, 10 years prior to this work, there's been a lot of effort on studying the quantitative genetics of hybrid mortality in Nasonia. So these are the five chromosomes of Nasonia, and I've plotted the larvae where regions of, uh, QTL regions of hybrid mortality have been placed right into the five chromosomes. Now I just spent the last half of the lecture telling you that microbes cause mortality. And then 10 years previous, previous to this work, people have been finding these genetic regions. How do we pull this all together? Well, this is the hologenome theory. If it really is real, we would expect that these genes would negatively interact with the microbiome to cause hybrid mortality. And that's what essentially this third locus, the symbiont locus with two nuclear loci predicts, that we'll see all these kinds of interactions of the nuclear loci with the microbiome that break down. Okay, so the next step is really to look at where these genes are, uh, what kinds of genes are they? And we've been characterizing the genome from an uh, innate immunity perspective, and we've uh, created a database that's now published, it's freely available, um, where we were essentially compiling insect immune genes that were known to then predict uh, the Nasonia immune gene set. And that's just called the uh, IIID if you want to look it up. And we've now done transcriptome analyses where we look at germ-free hybrids and compare the immune gene expression to dead hybrids that are either inoculated with bacteria or conventional hybrids. And what's consistent is that 40% of the genes are underexpressed in germ-free hybrids relative to inoculated or conventional hybrids that die. So we have a considerable number of genes that are misexpressed um, in inoculated and conventional hybrids relative to germ-free. These changes in gene expression may in fact be associated with the hybrid mortality as well as the nuclear genome. So let me put it all together for you in the future step. The future step is, is that we've removed the microbiome, we don't get mortality. Now we want to remove the gene part of this with a conventional microbiome and ask, do we not get mortality again? We can take the pluck the pieces, either the genome or the microbiome out. The prediction is we don't get mortality because the hologenome is required for mortality. So one way to do that is to take highly misexpressed candidate genes. So here's one, it's an antimicrobial peptide. It's a hundredfold underexpressed in these living germ-free hybrids relative to the dead hybrids. It happens to be benchmarked against the QTL analysis. So it's in a region where hybrid mortality is predicted to be. And we can use this as a candidate approach to RNAi knock down these genes and essentially stop the expression of those genes and therefore we predict to recover mortality. Uh, so that's where we want to go with this work. The other part where we want to go with this work is to test the universality of phylosymbiosis, to look at other insect and other um, mammalian invertebrate systems and ask in these well-structured species complexes from Paramiscus to Anopheles to Drosophila, if we go in and measure their gut microbiome, will we see a recapitulation as we did in Nasonia? And we want to do this in as many systems as possible to either refute the, the common feature of phylosymbiosis or support it 
as a measure of the whole genome in these animals. Okay, so just to summarize uh, speciation by symbiosis section, um, the hologenome has a phylogenetic and phylosymbiotic basis. And we see that in a pattern in which animals co-diverge with their host microbial communities. And in a sense, the microbiome is uniquely qualified in each host species that we looked at. Secondly, when we make hybrids, the microbiome breaks down and gets disrupted and is different from either parental species microbiome. And then thirdly, uh, hybrid lethality undoubtedly is a hologenomic trait because it requires both the genome and the microbiome um, and we're going to test truly whether the genome is required by removing the genome parts that are associated with mortality. Okay, um, just to conclude part one, Robert Brucker, this is a gratuitous uh, cute shot of my graduate student who has done largely all of this work. A lot of the credit goes to him. Um, rotation students, technicians, and informaticians shown here. And then these are five undergraduates who have all contributed to the work as it's ongoing and funding from the NSF dimensions of biodiversity. Uh, Aaron here is in med school as well as Marissa's in public health school. These other three students are still, still with us. Okay. Um, I will move on. I'll save questions for the end and move on to the second part. Um, the second part of the talk, which I'll wrap up, is called Targets of Change. And essentially what we're interested in here is how does a host ecology shape parasite genome evolution? So the imagery I have here is obviously an animal or a plant is a cocktail of microbes in its own genome. But beyond that, if you look even deeper microscopically, each microbe itself has an interaction with potentially bacteriophage or mobile genetic elements. So there's a three-party or tripartite tritrophic interaction that can occur in every animal and plant. And we're actually, instead of looking at agents of change, we're looking now at targets of change and what's happening to genomic changes inside the host. From, a, uh, from my perspective, I like to look at the bacterial world through three bacterial ecotypes. Um, from a host perspective, you can think about two types of bacteria infecting a host, right? Facultative intracellular bacteria, which replicate inside cells, but can also replicate in the open environment. Free-living bacteria can replicate in the outside world. They can even replicate inside the body. They just don't replicate inside host cells. And then obligate intracellular bacteria represents the most extreme ecological niche because these bacteria only replicate and depend on host cells for their fitness. Okay, a lot of good labs over many years have shown this to be quite true, which is that if you look at genome size, um, we sampled 400 genomes and just show that obligate intracellular bacteria, as was already known, have small genomes uh, relative to facultative and free-living bacteria, which has a lot more variation. So obligates classically get small. That's, that's the paradigm, um, and indeed, it's, it's well proven. Um, if you look at it from sort of a comparative perspective, free-living bacteria, big genomes, uh, phages, transposons, and plasmids abundant, exposure to other microbes, horizontal gene transfers going on. Um, if you look at an obligate intracellular bacteria, these are always small, they always have reduced genomes and reduced exposure to other microbes. However, we dissected the obligate intracellular bacteria out a little bit further and found that the ecology of the intracellular bacteria shapes their genome architecture. So it's not that all obligate intracellular bacteria have universally no mobile elements. In fact, if you look at host switching, horizontally transmitted intracellular bacteria, nearly all of those bacterial species have mobile DNA in their genomes. If you look at vertically transmitted species, which essentially go from one generation to the next, classic example would be P. aphids in their Buchner symbionts, these have very few species with mobile DNA, and there's a strong statistical support for this. So, why do host switching bacteria get mobile elements? How do they flourish? And what don't we understand about this? Because this has largely been the paradigm. And that's what some of our NIH and NSF work has been looking at over the last five years or so. So this is Wolbachia. Uh, this is an electron micrograph taken inside a testes tissue of an insect. And um, inside this Wolbachia are about 60 bacteriophage woe particles. Woe is just short for phage woe, phage Wolbachia. And then so these are the standard icosahedral structures, tail structures of bacteriophages blown up from here. 
If you look at uh, these two cells, so we have two Wolbachia here, this cell is quite granular in structure. It's about a micron in size, multiple membranes around, no phage. This cell has a quite different phenotype. It has a degraded DNA patch. It actually has membranes detaching from the outside, all of which are typical of lysis, and phage particles are shown to be polarized at this end, perhaps causing these maladaptive uh, lysis phenotypes. And then this was really the shot that um, was heard around the lab, if you will. So here is a Wolbachia cell, phage particles localized, in fact, leaving the cell almost as if there's a hole here in the Wolbachia cell, leaving outside of it. So we have an active bacteriophage, and we thought this would be a great model to look at how does a genome highly reduced that has an intracellular lifestyle tolerate um, a phage element, and vice versa, uh, how does a phage flourish inside a extreme ecological niche of an intracellular bacteria? So what are the rules here? How, does this, how can we shape the rules? Um, there are two barriers to phage invasion uh, for an intracellular bacteria. The first is, is that the phage has to get through the host cell. The second barrier is the phage has to get through the obligate intracellular membrane. So there's a host membrane and then membranes of the obligate intracellular bacteria. This appears to be a formidable set of barriers for a phage to deal with. Our hypothesis was that animals and plants, if you will, these are just integrative communities of microbes that could potentially interact in an intracellular way. So take any old animal here and we blow up a cell inside this animal, the cell now becomes the ecological arena rather than the outside environment. We think of the host internal environment as the ecological arena here. And we could imagine that different Wolbachia strains that co-infect the same cell transfer bacteriophage between each other. And we know that Wolbachia infect many different types of animals, um, and we also know that Wolbachia co-infect animals at a high rate. In addition, facultative intracellular bacteria can come and go. So they can live outside, they can come inside. And this provides the open source evolutionary material, if you will, for these elements to get into an obligate intracellular bacteria. So we call this the intracellular arena hypothesis because the cells has become the arena for microbial gene exchange between co-infections. So these are the nuts and bolts of Wolbachia's biology. Uh, so let me just go through some pictures here. Here's uh, uh, an embryo from Nasonia, stained in green is Wolbachia, stained in blue is the DNA that's dividing from this uh, host. And what you can see is the bacteria localized towards the posterior end of the embryo, and these bacteria are maternally transmitted from one generation to the next. And in fact, the cells here become the reproductive tissue cells. The host cells become the reproductive tissue cells for the next generation. So Wolbachia are already in the place to be inherited to the next generation. Okay. So arthropods are uh, uh, the primary host of Wolbachia. About 40% of all arthropod species harbor Wolbachia. Uh, arthropods comprise 85% of all animal species. So that makes Wolbachia one of the greatest pandemics in the history of life from a biodiversity perspective. We're talking about millions of species that harbor Wolbachia infections. And I could ask you to name, uh, name other cases where you know that a, an infection lives in millions of animal species and you might be hard pressed to find that. Okay, the nematode is uh, another phyla. Wolbachia infect 90% of filarial nematode species. Um, here we're looking at filarial nematodes that are infectious to mammals, so dog heartworm, uh, and then lymphatic filariasis and river blindness are diseases caused by filarial nematodes. And this is an individual suffering from river blindness here. As it turns out, the inflammation response that leads to river blindness and lymphatic filariasis is in fact caused by Wolbachia and not the nematode itself. All right. Okay, so some of the evidence for uh, gene transfer between Wolbachia and phages. So this is a phylogenetic tree of Wolbachia. Um, there are two main groups in arthropods. These two groups diverged about 60 million years ago, the A and B Wolbachia. If we look at their phylogeny, we see that um, the phylogeny of Wolbachia is completely unlike the phylogeny of the bacteriophage capsid gene. And we see a lot of diversity here. In fact, we lose the structure so that B. Wolbachia are genetically distinct from A. Wolbachia. 
And if you look at the phages from B. Wolbachi and A. Wolbachi, they're all mixed up as if there's kind of rampant transmission of the phages going on between the A and B Wolbachia. So this looks like a lot of horizontal transfer. Um, if you look at hosts that are co-infected with multiple strains of Wolbachia, so here's uh, crickets from Rick Harrison's lab, here's leaf beetles from Dan Funk's lab, and then some species that we've looked at in our lab. They all have multiple infections of A and B Wolbachia. And it turns out that their phage sequences from the A and B Wolbachia, or multiple B strains or multiple A strains, are all phylogenetically similar. So there's almost no sequence evolution going on between the phage from the A and the phage from the B Wolbachia. Now this is surprising because the A and B Wolbachia diverged 60 million years ago, yet the phage sequences are completely identical. And so we see repeated instances of transfer of the phage between these co-infections in the same host. All right, so once we documented that transfer, we wanted to know, is this happening at single genes? Is the phage just moving single genes through recombination? Or is it in fact moving through whole genomes where the phage jumps from one infection to the other in this intracellular environment? Okay, so to do that, we developed a sequencing technology. Um, we adopted targeted sequence capture to actually sequence genomes, and I'll tell you what we mean by that. So an animal is, of course, a conglomerate of microbial entities as well as its own cells. One way to try and tr capture the genomes of particular infections is to laboriously isolate through pulse field gel electrophoresis chromosomes from any particular symbiont. That can be a lot of work, take a lot of centrifugations, a lot of pulse field work. What we thought we could do was use sequence capture. So we take a set of Wolbachia probes to Wolbachia genomes. We lay them down on a glass array. We then take the animal, uh, obviously extract the DNA, and hybridize all this DNA to the array. Now, only the DNA that gets targeted to the probes on the glass slide would be captured. Everything else washes off. And then we sequenced to see if we could sequence that particular pathogen. Indeed, that works extremely well, which we, nobody had done until now, and it, it turned out that this is gonna be a very effective way for clinicians or, or biologists to, to isolate out genomes of particular infections from a complicated environment or from a host. So 98% of the reads uh, map to Wolbachia, and only a few percent map to other stuff. Um, I can tell you a little bit about that later if you're interested in what that is. Now, we were doing that to capture these Wolbachia genomes and then compare their phage regions to ask how common or how much of the genome is transferred between the A and B Wolbachia. And so what you see here is the phage A Wolbachia, phage from A Wolbachia's genome, and the phage genome from B Wolbachia, excuse me, are completely syntonous, in fact, pretty identical. Yet, these are two very different Wolbachia that diverged about 60 million years ago. So we're looking at probably the only portion of the genome that's this syntonous. And in fact, the gene identity is quite strong between these regions. The only difference are transposons and yellow blocks that have jumped into the B. Wolbachia phage region and knocked out neighboring genes. So we have some gene deletion inside these areas. But other than that, these things are very syntonous and identical. So this is the sequence homology of the phage regions. They're about 99.9% .9 similar, which is much higher than just standard MLST genes um, comparisons between the A and B Wolbachia, and higher than even other internal control genes where phage genes that have not transferred have been in these A and B Wolbachia genomes and show even higher rates of divergence from the MLST genes. So the only genes that have transferred are in fact these phages, therefore showing really for the first time the largest transfer of mobile genetic information in phage DNA between intracellular bacteria. This, this kind of model scales up to other hosts. So here's a tick that's co-infected with rickettsia as well as Wolbachia. And these two mobile entities actually share 10 kilobases of DNA at pretty high nucleotide similarity, suggesting a ancient transfer of this particular region between co-infecting symbionts in this tick. And just to sort of wrap up the, the idea here, and we don't know this for sure, but Bartonella henseli is an alpha proteobacteria. It's a facultative intracellular bacteria. 
Wolbachia is down here, and these two share prophage regions that are in fact very similar to each other, and they both share the same host on occasion, which is the cat flea. So again, when a host has multiple infections that are intracellular, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's no gene exchange. There could be lots of gene exchange going on here. Okay, so the paradigm of this tripartite symbiosis that we think of, at least, is that in free-living bacteria, you get lots of open environment exchange between unrelated phages, and sometimes these phages recombine their genomes with each other, and we get recombinogenic phage genomes from the free-living bacterial world. In the intracellular world, we see exchanges happening within the cellular environment, although these phages are pretty related to each other. So we don't see lots of new gene information coming in. We see, in fact, mostly gene loss or transposon insertions, rearrangements, and so forth. But we do see transfer within this environment. Okay. So how important uh, are these observations for the general biology of intracellular bacteria? And I would raise the idea that very widespread symbionts, or organelles, will consistently show mobile genetic element invasion. Chlamydia has phages as well. So these are little pockets of chlamydia phages coming off of chlamydia cells. I've talked to you about Wolbachia. Mitochondria and chloroplasts both have evidence of ancient genes involved in transcription that in fact came from bacteriophages. The fourth, the, these four things have one thing in common. They're the most abundant intracellular bacteria and endosymbionts on the planet. So the idea here is that the winners in the intracellular world get attacked, that they become susceptible to invaders because they experience a wider host range and a wider gene pool sometime in their evolutionary history. The kill the winner paradigm applies just as well to intracellular bacteria as it does to free living bacteria. Okay, the future um, to wrap up. So this individual obviously has river blindness and there's a lot of interest in, sorry, treating river blindness through antimicrobial drugs. Because, as I mentioned before, Wolbachia are, in fact, the cause of river blindness and lymphatic filariasis, not the nematode. So if you can kill Wolbachia, and this has been shown with general antibiotics, you can eradicate these diseases from these individuals. Now, antibiotic administration to hundreds of millions of people in the world that are afflicted with these diseases is not going to work because you would get widespread resistance to antibiotics evolving in these populations. So there are efforts underway, um, not only in my lab, but in other labs funded by the Gates Foundation to develop specific anti-Wolbachia drugs that kill Wolbachia and not any other microbe. What we think we can do with our basic science work on the phage is isolate the enzymes that kill Wolbachia, the phage enzymes that lyse Wolbachia, and use those as a form of phage enzyme therapy to develop perhaps, and there's a lot of perhaps in there, a, a drug that kills Wolbachia and therefore treats river blindness. In doing that, we've come, upon, come across some cool evolution stuff. So this is the phylogeny of the lysozyme from phage woe, except we have taxon here that harbor this phage lysozyme that we didn't expect. Archaea in red, fungi in orange, plants in green, animals, insects in blue, and then bacteria in black. This lysozyme has moved across the tree of life without any restriction whatsoever. And I think there's probably a good explanation for that, which is that if the lysozyme is an antibacterial, wouldn't many kinds of organisms want to co-opt a new component to their immune system? So that's what we're intrigued by right now. I can't tell you I have any evidence for that in any serious way, but that's what we're pursuing as a future and extended project of this phage work. So the, the one thing I can show you is the structure from the archaea lysozyme, which is in green here, and then a lot of other stuff, the structure of the plant lysozyme and the structure of the Wolbachia lysozyme through homology modeling actually all look the same. They all have this beta barrel structure. The active sites in red are conserved. And so that suggests that, in fact, this thing probably is active for bacterial uh, lysis. And we want to do this um, some, in some in vitro ways to test if that's actually occurring. Okay. Summary. Um, we think of the intracellular world as not as a closed world, but as an open world, and that parasites, mutualists, and commensalists can all interact with each other, um, as well as facultative intracellular bacteria that come and go. 
So this is an open niche, not necessarily a closed niche. We've um, shown the largest transfer of, of phage DNA in intracellular bacteria uh, in Nasonia. And we've developed this sequencing technology that, while not a biological result, I think scales to many biological problems and it worked really well for us. So I'd like to thank um, the undergrads here. So we have two undergrads that went to med school from this work, Carolyn and John. Uh, we have a lot of Vanderbilt collaborators, but the two that are most influential in this work are Irene Newton, who was a postdoc with me and now is at Indiana University, and Jason, who's working on this um, phage lysozyme stuff, antibacterial stuff. Uh, funding from the NIH uh, Evolution of Infectious Disease Program and the Symbiosis NSF panel. And I thank you for listening. Happy to take any questions. We haven't, although that's been suggested to us a number of times. So I think the more I keep hearing it, the more we should do it. Um, or if we just let the hybrids sort of sort themselves out and they self-mate, you know, where will they go in this population? Let me take that question to the Nasonia part, and, and I think I can get around the noise in the system here because we're doing it all in the lab. So Nasonia isn't experiencing a lot of dead carcass material and things like that. So what it's accumulating in increase in diversity is in fact what it's doing in a sterile lab environment. I wouldn't say sterile, but a lab environment that's more sterile than the wild. Uh, what I think is happening in that turnover is there are microbes at low abundance in Nasonia already or in contact with the host. And as the microbiome turns over through defecation of the first poop, for example, where the insect cleans out its gut, that may cause a new sort of invasion, a succession of microbes. And then that continues through development. Um, that's my guess. Uh, I think what we do in the lab will be taken to the field because it has to, right? That's the natural stuff. But what we want to understand is, is there a phylosymbiotic pattern when these variables are isolated? And then we'll, let's see how much phylosymbiosis is occurring once we get to the field and what components of the field is affected by dietary factors versus phylosymbiotic factors. Yes, sir. Do you have any data from your larval microbiome <clears throat> that the microbiome changes before, during, and after death of the larvae? Yeah, so the microbiome data, that's a great question. The microbiome data I showed is just before larval death uh, because we didn't want to uh, sort of confound the mortality with whatever microbes can then freely invade. So we're doing it at the L1, L2 stage, which is just before death. So it's really neat that that microbiome shift happens uh, before we observe mortality. Yeah. Question back. So there's an entire industry of people isolating speciation genes. For example, the the and the and the the shadow and the Are you suggesting that the primary role of those genes is the interaction with the microbiome? What I'm suggesting is that we're at the beginning of a frontier, I think, as an evolutionary community to understand how important the microbiome is in evolution. It doesn't negate anything that's happening from a genetic perspective. But some fraction, if not a large fraction of those genes, I don't know how large, but probably it would surprise evolutionary biologists if it's 20% of those speciation genes, in fact, interact with the microbiome. Certain reproductive isolation traits 
will be more susceptible to microbiome interactions. I think hybrid mortality, we're going to see a lot of genes that potentially interact with the microbiome. Hybrid sterility, which is a germline problem, not so much. Uh, if you take David Presgrave's discovery of NUP96, it was categorized as a uh, nuclear pore. But that nuclear pore lets RNA viruses come in. And that's a, probably an example where just looking at his story, there could be a symbiotic component of that where the viruses, in fact, are causing the hybrid viability of NUP that's associated with NUP96. So my thesis is that a fraction will be associated with the microbiome, and that'll still be surprising to many speciation biologists. Yeah. Um, well, the repeated fashion I think is not a problem because the repeated fashion could happen through the stable immune genes selecting for the microbiome from a dynamic environment, right? So there is an interconnectedness between those genes and the microbiome. You cannot understand an immune gene without understanding the microbes it interacts with. Period. So as an organism develops anew, those immune genes are sequestering microbes, in theory, that are uniquely qualified for that species. Therefore, there's no problem in an animal acquiring the kinds of microbes that it needs because the immune system is stably right there doing it. Now, that's my hypothesis. I don't know if that's true, but when we see patterns like phylosymbiosis uh, and we see patterns about breakdown in immune systems, certainly is, is on the trajectory. And I would argue that the questions we have now are questions that geneticists had 100 years ago. Right? So they were asking questions about how is a gene inherited? What happens to a gene's mutation? What's a gene's fitness effect? What's the quantitative genetics? Well, we need to apply those same questions to the microbiome right now, and if you give me 100 years, I'll have answers to all these questions. That's only fair, right? Very <laughs> glad to take one more question. Um, I guess my question is following up on the quantitative genetic, which where I was going. Is so if G plus E equals microbiome, what's the heritability of the microbiome? I mean, I, I know you haven't exactly done that analysis, but I'm wondering kind of about intraspecific variation. And if, I don't know if anybody has done that analysis. That I mean, it's a lot of work. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think there's uh, you can count the number of evolutionary biologists looking at the microbiome as a evolutionary unit on your hand, right? Yeah. So we need the thousands of evolutionary biologists to jump on board. <laughs> Whatever traits you're studying, behavior, morphology, uh, speciation, it's time to think about the microbiome. That's my opinion. So I, would, I think people should answer that question is my response. Yeah. That's a lot of sequencing. <laughs> All right. Let's think so. Thanks. Thanks.